Good evening. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Daniel chapter 4. I'd like us just to kind of look at this chapter in uh, reflection of this is a letter from a king. This is uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. He was uh, king of Babylon. And I want us to look at what his dream was, his sentence that he was delivered, and also look at his deliverance. What did he learn from this? He was used as God's judge against Israel. We spoke a little bit this morning about King Zedekiah and Jeremiah, how he told him to get out of the city. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was the reason why he needed to get out of the city. He was the king of Babylon. Babylon's located about, I think they said, 54 miles outside of modern-day Baghdad. And they equated King Nebuchadnezzar, just from a history standpoint, as the greatest king of the East. They said that he was bigger than what they feel Alexander even was. Uh, And the reason they say that is because of all the ruins that they dug up around that area. Nine nine out of ten of the bricks they found had his name on it. So it lets you know this was no small warlord. He was king of the world at the time. So God used him to judge Israel. So with that in, taking that into respect, it's interesting what he learned. And I think the Lord's in this, I hope, to can share with you what he showed me. So let's read here starting verse 1, chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. These are big words from a big man. He was king of everything, all nations, all tribes, all languages in the earth. And he says in verse 2, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought towards me. And if the Lord ever does something for you, you will share it just like he did. So he's, he, the Lord's done something from him, and he has the means and desire here to share that. You'll tell people, and somebody might be thinking, well, am I witnessing enough? You won't have to worry about that if somebody asks you about who you know and about what he did for you. The Lord's people will tell who they know and what he did for them. I think the problem comes in is when nobody asks, we have something to say kicking doors open that aren't necessarily open. In my own experience, I found if I wait, the Lord's in it, He'll open that door. And we're to wait on Him to open that. So in verse 3, He says, How great are His signs, and how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion is from generation to generation. He had been shown something. I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is, take note of this, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. Now I find this interesting that how he describes himself at this point. He's at rest in his house and flourishing in his palace. So you can go ahead and take note that if you're at rest in your house and flourishing in your palace, watch out because the Lord exacted judgment on this man for many of the things he did. He's basically saying, I feel good, I've got lots of money, and I don't have a care in the world. He's doing just fine, and so what does he need? He doesn't need anything. He's doing just fine. How high did he esteem God? What did he need from him? He didn't need anything from God. He, in his own rights, was God in himself in his own land. What good is a Savior if you don't need saving? And this is where King Nebuchadnezzar was at this time. And in verse 5, he says, I saw a dream which made me afraid. And the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head, they troubled me. Now this is me if there's anything. I'm afraid because I saw something. And why is it the only time we fear, why is it the only time we take careful note of something is when something pops out and grabs hold of us and scares us? You know, why can't we do that, you know, in the day to day? because we're distracted with everything else. We're worried about where we're going to go to eat, what we're going to do the next day, what clothes we're going to wear, and what bills we have to pay. 
these are the normal things we have in this life to worry about. But something caught his attention here that the Lord did for him. So in verse 6, he says, Therefore I made a decree, after, after having this troubled vision, to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. So did he go to God for help here? Is God, is God who he sought out to, to help understand who brought this to him? No. He said he wanted to bring out every wise man in the land to do this. So everybody but God or anyone who knew him. So read on. Then came in the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. So we find in our own experience here, often God is often the last resort we seek out after we've exhausted everything else. Do we find that in our own experience? When we finally have, find that we think we have some strength, we try to bring it into submission. Or maybe I'll look at the problem and apply some intelligence to it. I, I want a clever way to get around this. I think I can get around it this way. And this is what he was doing by trying to bring in all these wise men because some were soothsayers, some were astrologers. He's going to throw everything he's got at this at this point. Um, even, even money, he's saying that fixes anything or the other th way we can address it is just ignore it altogether. But he's bringing in all these people to try to address this. So in verse 8, but at the last, I'm at the last resort because they couldn't tell me anything, Daniel came in before me whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of, my, of mine head in my bed. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong. The height thereof reached unto heaven, and the side thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. And I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and an holy one came down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said, Thus, hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, and let the beasts get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. And let his heart be changed from a man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. So now, We've heard what the dream was, so he's explained what it is. So now I want us to look at the next verse, which tell us, here's the purpose of the dream. Verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the word of the holy ones, to the extent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. And he giveth it to whomsoever he will. And he setteth up over it the basest of men. And these are what I'm going to be the next three points that we look at here. These three things that we're told that in verse 17 it says, To the intent the living may know, the first, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. Second, he giveth it to whomsoever he will. And third, he setteth up over it the basest of men. So first, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. That means that he's king of kings. That means there's nobody over him and that if there is anybody that's powerful in the earth, he's their king. All will bow before him. Now, some will bow willingly, and some will be bow because, bowing because they're made to bow. But either way, he's still the king. Every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. Things in earth, things under the earth, things above the earth. But they'll bow to his name. Why? They'll bow because he's God's son, the anointed 
the most highly favored. They'll bow because he's the Savior. He paid with his own blood for a lost people. He ransomed them, gave his life. They'll bow because he's the conquering king, because he's crushed the devil under his foot. When he died on the cross, he put away sin. The devil has nothing to say to me. He also holds the keys to sin and death. There's no more power sin and death can have because he rules over sin and death. Because the strength of sin, of sin is the law, and he fulfilled the law, so sin and death have no power here. Now some kings will rule by might. They rule because they're strong, stronger than somebody else. Some kings will rule by right. It's because their order in which they've been born into the family, and it's their right to rule. Both are true of him, but he possesses a greater and a third attribute in that he's the king that we desire. He's king by might, he's the king by right, but he's also the king because we love him and we want him to be our king. There's never been a greater king, and there never been worse subjects than us, his people. But he is the king because we love him to be the king. So the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. If it's done, it's because he did it. The second thing that King Nebuchadnezzar was given to learn was he giveth it the kingdom to whomsoever he will. Now I want to give you a little illustration here before I speak about this with regard to he giveth the kingdom to whomsoever he will. So in my backyard, I decided one day that I was going to build a raised garden. You know where I chose to put that garden? Right underneath my deck because that's where I wanted it. And I built it the way I wanted to build it. I used four, four by eights and built it one way and then made a square race garden. I put dirt in it. And you know, I decided what plants that I wanted in it. And those are the plants I decided to put in it. And I watered it when I wanted to water it. I didn't do it every day, but I did it when I wanted to. And when fruit came up from my garden, I choose what fruits I wanted to eat. And then when I had my fill, I left what was there. Let the less ever the rest of it rot at the end of the season because I didn't want all of it. But at the end of the day, this was my garden and I can do whatever I want with it. That's pretty clear from what we would experience in our own life and the way we think about things like that that you would do in your own life. Looking at this in respect to we are all God's creatures. We are His and He can do with us whatever He chooses to do with us because we're His. Whatever He's pleased to do. And what did he do? He took some of those people and he put them in Christ. And he put them in Christ to preserve them so that when this world was, they would be preserved so that he wouldn't have to exact judgment on them. That's what he chose to do with his people. This is called election. He elected a people, put them in Christ before the beginning of the world, and in time he calls them to salvation and that work that he's done in them, he'll give them a new heart and he'll raise them again. The, it is his work to preserve them. Otherwise, they would be lost. Now, we have no strength to believe, no strength to keep the law, and we're condemned outside of election. It's the only way you can be saved. And anyone who doesn't love election or the God of election is outside of Christ. That can't be more plain. God can do with his people as he's pleased. He's God. He has that right. So the Most High giveth it kingdom to whomsoever he will. The third thing King Nebuchadnezzar was given to learn, he setteth it up over the basest of men. Is this you, the basest of men? Basest of men just means the lowest. It means you're nobody. You didn't deserve it. You weren't strong enough to get it. But he's saying he set it up over it the kingdom over with the basest of men. Now, if you're ever to be in the kingdom of heaven, this better be you, the lowest, because that's the way up in the kingdom of heaven is to go down. If you will, turn with me over to Luke chapter 4. Verse 18, this is the Lord reading the 
book of Isaiah when it was delivered him in the temple. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. He in recovering the sight of the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, this is probably not the way that you and I would do it. This is probably not the uh, way that the people that we would choose, the poor, the brokenhearted, the bruised, the blind. These are people really nobody wants because really all they can do is be dependent upon somebody else. They can't do anything for me. So these people are a burden. But yet, these are the people that the Lord chose to say, these are the people I came to save. These are the people whom I have an interest in. Aren't you thankful for that? So he's saying he sets the lowest up in the kingdom. Who is set on high? The basis, the lowest. Not the most devout, not the smartest, but the lowest. And this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had to learn this. How did he learn this? Well, we read it already. They said, cut down the tree. So if, you, if we'll pick up reading in verse 20 here. The tree that you saw, this is Daniel speaking to him, which grew and was strong, and whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof unto all the earth, whose leaves were fair, the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the feed dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king. You see, this tree grew and it got strong. And he said, And thou art grown and become strong, and from thy greatness is grown. And it reaches to the heavens, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. We're looking at the picture right now of this tree and how this represents this king. And, and what, what attributes we see about this tree describes him as the man. So first it says the tree grew. We know that the tree got very large. Now... Everyone in here in their own mind has gotten large in your own mind. How many things in your life have you not given God the glory for what you've accomplished in your own life? You've quickly said, you know, I did pretty well at that. And you've done that. Everybody has. But that's what this man was doing. He has grown large. So God is not giving, getting the glory in here. It also says that he's grown strong. This speaks of self-righteousness speaks of presumption, how that we can provide our own works that God can accept. So it's saying, I'm strong enough to be able to do this. I can stand on my own. I have the ability and the power to do so. What else to say about the tree? It says the tree was very high. When we think high of ourselves, what word comes to your mind? Pride came to mind. This man was prideful. He thought a lot of himself, and I think we'll see later from his words, it's clear. It says that he was seen by the whole earth. The word seen jumps out, lets us know that's vanity. He was a show. Everything about him was big, king of all the earth, king of all languages, biggest kingdom there was. Crushed every army around him, so he had thought a lot of himself. He was vain. And it said underneath it was fruit and meat for all, all the, fowl, all the beasts and fowls of the air lodged in it. He has no need for God, he has everything he needs. Meets there, shelters there. What does he need God for? He's king. He's got everything he needs. This, rem this reminded me at least of the parable the Lord gave about the rich man who said his barns were full. And he said, soul, take thine ease. You know, your barns are full. I'm going to tear these down and big, build a bigger one. And, you know, the Lord said to him, thou fool, this night thy soul should be required of thee. Then whose things will those things be that you've saved up? So you see... He's looking to the wrong reasons here. He's looking to everything around him, his accomplishments. He's looking to his things and who he is. So we're seeing pride, vanity, strength, standing on his own. And in verse 22, he's saying, King, it's you. With regard to everything we've said here, pride, vanity, no need for God, strong on our own, which of these charges are you not guilty of yourself? We can look at him and say, yeah, he's guilty of that. But in your own heart of hearts, if you're honest with yourself, you can say you're guilty of every one of these as well. In verse 23, Whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew down the tree 
and destroy it. Yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, and even with the band of iron and brass, and in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the field, till seven times pass over him. Now jump over to verse 30. And the king spake, and this is a little bit later after he's heard all of this, and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? There's no pride going on here. While the word was yet in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling place shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou knowest that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and he giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now with regard to yourself, and with regard to this man we see here, all God has to do is to take his hand off of you, and you will be wilder than any beast that this man became. Do you know that about yourself? That except for the Lord's restraining grace on you, what you would be? He took his hand off of Nebuchadnezzar, and he made him lose his mind. And he wandered out in the fields and in the grass for seven years. What, what he thought or did during that time, we don't know. But what we do know is it tells us the trial was for seven years, this trial that he brought in his life. Why seven? Seven, we know, is the number of perfection, the number of completion. So then, why does the Lord send his children these trials? And I believe we'll find, if you turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, this lets us know one of the reasons why the Lord does this. In Ephesians 4, in the first half of this verse 12, he says, it's for the perfecting of the saints. What is the perfecting of the saints? The perfecting of the saints is the maturation, the maturing of our faith, the maturing of our walk, the maturing of our view in this world. Now, if you are saved, you are holy. You're never more holy. You're never less holy. To be very clear, this has nothing to do with sanctification. You're either sanctified, which is holy, or you're not. There are no degrees of holiness. There are no degrees of growth in sanctification. So that's, that has to be clear from the outset. But what we do have is growth in this world because you have your flesh, you have your new man. What do you know today and what faith, the strength of your faith today is different from maybe the first day you ever heard the gospel? There's growth there. There's time, there's experiences, there's things you learned. This is what the perfecting of the saints is. And I believe this is what the Lord here was performing to Nebuchadnezzar during this trial. We're never more holy, we're never less. There's nothing else required for our entrance to heaven. If you're holy, then you can only be holy. Yet the Lord bestows his blessings on his people through envelopes with black borders. He uses trials in order to teach us. Sometimes it's the only time we listen. And when he can block out all the, all the other nonsense that I'm distracted by, kind of as I said earlier, what causes me to be afraid is when something grabs hold of me. I quit worrying about what I'm gonna have for dinner tonight, where I've gotta to go to work tomorrow, do I have clothes ready, are my bills paid, all these other things that distract us that really don't mean anything. But yet the Lord can grab hold of you, and he shook this tree. He cut this tree down, brought him down low, so that he could see what he was and who the Lord was. Now, for a believer, the Lord uses this for the perfecting of the saints, to growth in grace, maturing in the faith. But to someone who is not a believer, who's not one of the Lord's children, they're going to get mad probably get mad at God for the trial and for the difficulty in their life. These people get mad and they leave. They want nothing to do with the Lord. If this is what it costs in order for me to be associated with the gospel, if that's what they associate this with, they'll leave. So the Lord's people won't do that. 
the Lord's people, it'll cause you to pray more. It'll cause you to seek His face more. How sweet is the gospel when you're in the midst of a trial? You may have nothing else that you can rest on, that you can lean on and say, I've got some comfort in this. But you know when you come where the gospel's preached, where the Lord's promised He'll be, that's where I go for comfort. That's where I go for a word. That's where I go for a cool drink so that I can know that I'm the Lord's and He's loved me and I'm going to be okay. Even though I can't see it at the time, but we go to hear that. The Lord's people, it doesn't drive them away from God, it drives them to God. And so this is what it does for the Lord's people. What would you know of mercy had you not needed it? Had the Lord shown you that you couldn't bail yourself out and apart from Him doing something for you, you won't even know what mercy is. That's what mercy is, is knowing that He's got to do it for me. And I am completely reliant on Him. And if He doesn't do me, do it for me, I won't have it. What would I know of mercy apart from Him putting me through that experience to feel that? What would I know of the patience that I've learned, which is not a lot, but what would I know of patience had the Lord not been silent? What a trial that is when the Lord feels that He shuts off communion with you. He's just silent. You don't feel like He hears your prayers. You don't feel like you're able to, to worship when you come to services. But yet it causes me to wait. What would I have ever learned of waiting if he had not put me through that and made me to wait? What would we ever know about being gracious to others had someone not else not been gracious with me? There are times, many times, that I've said really stupid things with my mouth that I shouldn't have said or done things that I shouldn't have done when by all rights I deserve to have somebody come down on me for it. But somebody dealt kindly with me. They didn't come down on me. They dealt graciously with me. That lends me to see that I'm to be gracious to others. And what would I know of my other inability had he not shown me my weakness? And the Lord shows that in a lot of different ways. But I think specifically when we're given sickness, it shows us how quickly this strength's gone. He lays you on your back in a bed and you don't realize how frequently we should be praying for, Lord, give me strength for the day. Something we don't even think about often. And it can be taken from us so quickly. You look at the other side of that is, we have no spiritual strength whatsoever. If He doesn't give it to us, that's why we pray for the Lord, send your spirit here when we preach the gospel. Quicken your people. Because if He doesn't, it's just words. We're just sitting here. And what are we doing? We can't worship. We can't hear. I need that strength. I need Him to do that for me. I wouldn't trade the experience of being separated from that because it's taught me how precious it is when I do have it. What would we know of the sweet had we not tasted the bitter? And this is what the Lord puts His people through in this life when He goes through trials. These things are precious because they're learned through experience. For some, Perfecting may come on the road to Emmaus when the Lord was walking with those disciples and He enlarged their spiritual understanding by expounding the gospel to them, telling them who He was, showing Himself in the scriptures. There was spiritual maturing going on. With That's how the Lord used that experience in them. But for others, it might be drag, being dragged by the hand out of a burning Sodom. I found more so that's my experience. I have to have the Lord drag me through a trial because I don't know any better on what to do. So whatever it is, we have to look at what are we learning through this perfecting. It's not, at the time we can't see it, but when the Lord brings us on the other side, it's always for our spiritual betterment so that we can trust more. We know, what would you know more about your faith and, and for his faithfulness had he not caused you to wait on him? So what did King Nebuchadnezzar hear? Because he's the one who's put through the trial we're looking at here. What did he learn through this experience? Well, in verse 34, he says, At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. His understanding. What was the first thing that he did once his understanding returned unto him? He said, I bless the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. The first thing that he did was bless the Lord God. 
And he praised and he thanked him for who he was. That's the first thing he did. He understood to give God the glory in all that he did, even though we're, we're pawns in his hand. But yet everything that he's doing in this life is all built around the salvation and perfecting of his people. Everything that he does. We might not see it. It might not be about me. It might be, be about somebody else over here that I'm affecting and that the Lord's using that for their spiritual perfection. He learned from this, in this first verse, he learned to be thankful. He learned to be thankful for God to provide it for him and to bring him out of this trial. The second thing here in verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Did he have a high view of himself anymore? These words here are not somebody who has a high view of himself anymore. He understands, me included, the king of everything in the world here, reputed as nothing. He said, I'm nothing. The Lord taught this man humility, taught this man his place. He was bow down, sinner. And that's what this man learned. He was reputed as nothing. You, when you're nothing, you don't have any problem being the lowest. You have nowhere to go because you're already nothing. No, when you're nothing, you have, you have nothing to look up to. And he said, he doeth according to his will. He held no judgment on God for what his providences were. He doeth according to his will. Not my will, not my wishes, not what I want. It's what his will is. He was resigned to the Lord's will. And not in a way where he's resigned um, ungratefully saying, I, I know it's the Lord's will. I have to. That's not what we're called to be. We're called to say, Lord, thank you for whatever your will is and trust him that it's, it's for our good and for his glory. And he said, none can stay his hand. His purpose and his will will always be accomplished. What of the Lord's promises? Name one that's ever not been fulfilled. There's not one. He brought this heathen king into Jerusalem and he's taken this heathen king and he's turned his heart. And he was thankful for this. Consider this. He has the power to make you clean. If He cleanses you, washes you from your sins, and He makes you clean, is there anyone, is there anything that can make you unclean? The devil himself can't. The people of this world can't. And even you yourself, even if you look at yourself and you say, I'm in my flesh as I am right now, I don't see it. I feel unclean. I'm clean if He says I'm clean whether I see it or not. He has the power to make me clean. And the next thing he learned, his reasoning in verse 36, at the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and my brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. The Lord will bless his people, even turn the heart of this heathen king. If he can turn the heart of this heathen king, who this Belteshazzar named for Daniel, that was the name of one of his gods. So he, I mean, this was a heathen king that he turned his heart to see who the Lord God was. He wasn't one of the gods. He was the God. He turned his heart. He gave his reasoning. And he's seeing that, the, that in everything he, the Lord did for him, and what the Lord didn't have to do any of these things for him in verse 36 where he said he gave him the glory of his kingdom, his honor and his brightness. His, his counselors went to him and his, he added excellent majesty. It was added unto him. These are things were more than what he had before. The Lord didn't have to do those things. But the Lord is gracious and full of mercy. He learned those things about the Lord during this time when the Lord turned this. And now in verse 37 he says, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways are judgment. And those that walk in pride, he's able to abase. He said, now I see his works, they're the truth. My works, salvation by works, anything that has nothing to do with my works, the logical inference there is it's not true. It's not, the Lord won't accept that, but His works, everything that He does, that's truth, and His ways are judgment. When we look at His ways, we can see how He can be just and justify our sins. His ways are just. 
how he sees me. If he says I'm clean, even in the moment that I'm sinning right now, I'm clean and he's just for it because he paid for those sins and that's how I'm seen in Christ. And King Nebuchadnezzar goes on to say, all those work that walk in pride, well, he knows just how to deal with them. Because look what he did to me. <laughs> Made me walk as a beast in the forest and lose my mind. So the Lord knows just how to meet our pride on the grounds that we approach. Now, how precious are his trials that he sends for the perfecting of his saints. Now, we can't see them often as, per, as precious at the time because it's a trial. It's meant to be a trial. And, but yet, on the other side, just as King Nebuchadnezzar here saw, after he brought him out of the trial, he thanked the Lord for him. He thanked the Lord for blessing him, for restoring him, and for giving him a right view of who God was. Even though temporally, often on the other side of trials, sometimes we're not, we're not maybe as good a situation as we were before it. Outwardly, but inwardly, the gold that's been wrought in your heart by the Lord teaching you through that trial, you can't, there's no price for that. There's no price for being able to trust His faithfulness because He was faithful to you when you needed it. None of His children will ever trade knowing more of His faithfulness, knowing more of His long-suffering, and knowing more of His love for His people or of His mercy, which endures forever. Now, this was a letter from a king, King Nebuchadnezzar. And I pray God would give you the same spirit that He gave this king. Cause us to be thankful. Cause us to know that He's on the throne and cause us to know that all the things that He sends in, in our lives are for the perfecting of the saints.